Scano. My name is Rick Hill. I'm the Senior Project Coordinator at Deo Hahage, the Indigenous Knowledge Center at Six Nations Polytechnic. Today we're going to take a journey back in time and take a look at the formation of the Great Law and all of the lessons that we learned from the peacemaker, all of his teachings that were codified in a series of wampum belts. Some of them you may be familiar with and some you may be seeing for the first time. This is one of the earliest depictions of the formation of the Confederacy. We see it was done in 1853. It's kind of cartoonish-like, but it shows the peacemaker and his helper, Hiawenta, confronting Tadadaho's head is covered with snakes. He's bringing the message of peace to him. This more modern depiction by Warren Lyons from Onondaga shows the peacemaker now all dressed in white with Hiawenta and the other Haudenosaunee chiefs as they're singing this song in order to pacify Tadadaho. Warren said that he kind of altered the painting because of the actual depiction of Tadadaho in the oral history has his body look much more fearsome, his face uh, quite uh, terrible. So that is why Oren has Tadadaho facing away from us so we don't see his horrific look. Originally he had actually had his hand on a skull because Tadadaho was known to kill many people. But this was done for the Onondaga Savings Bank and he thought for public consumption he might want to change it. This is the painting I did in 1981, trying to show the peacemaker and Hiawenta his helper as they're actually carrying this wampum belt that was used when the Confederacy was formed, this great message of peace. Now, as I learned from a lot of old people, a lot of the chiefs, a lot of our mentors that helped me understand what the Great Law is, I also had to help recover these wampum belts. So what I'm going to share with you is a combination of the stories that I heard, some of the things that I read, uh, interviews of our people from the past, and then my own reflections of studying the teachings of the wampum belts. Wampum, which is made from clamshells, is very important to the Haudenosaunee, in fact, to many of the native nations in the Northeast. We can see these big belts that are used to commemorate our history, attest to the significance of the message they have there. But every generation would create a wampum belt reader, somebody who would know how to interpret the message. They would have been taught from a very young age. But also wampum is said to have this ability to capture our words. So as you hold the belt, you're able to recover its message. In this way, our oral history has remained true throughout the years. There are many different names for the great law. Some people say it actually means this great goodness or this great movement towards uh, goodness. It's really all about the same thing, that there's this founding principle, this law, this way of being that enables us to head towards peace and then maintain that. So peace is supposed to be the goal in our lives, but from the creation story reaffirmed in the great law, but as we all know, it's been a very difficult uh, way of life to maintain. Hayawenta was suffering from the death of his daughters. Tadadaho had used his ability and uh, power to uh, kill three of his daughters. He got so depressed he wandered in the woods, dejected. He just looked at the ground. But slowly, these words came into his mind. He began to think that if I ever met somebody who was suffering from the same kind of grief, these are the kind of things that I would tell him. Magic was taking place. Somehow the earth and its power and the historic setting, the time was right for this message of condolence to come to his mind. He began to string these beads made out of wood to remember the words that he was hearing. And then along came the peacemaker, and he heard him, he picked up those beads, and he began to recite these words that were used to restore Hiawanta's good mind. The metaphor for that state that he was at is called uh, at the edge of the woods in the thorny bushes, as if like this arduous journey, you know, you get uh, all kinds of dirt and craters attached to you, you get these thorns that would pierce your moccasins and make your life quite uncomfortable, and you have to take this rest. And as you would sit there, then we would restore this mind. There are several different stories of the origin of wampum. This one here by John Arthur Gibson in 1912 talks about the transformation. Originally, we used uh, beads made out of uh, elderberry wood, has a soft center in it, or we would use uh, beads made out of feather quills to send the messages. So the feather quill or the wood beads would be carried from a runner, carrying the message to another village or another leader. But Hiawenta, they said he was in his depression, he was wandering around the lakes south of Onondaga, the Tully Lakes. He came to this one lake, and there's a whole bunch of ducks on there. And he watched them for a long time, but then as he stepped forward, probably stepped on a twig and made a, made a noise, all of those ducks, they flapped their wings, and you can imagine they were able to lift the water up with them. And then as he looked out on the dry lake bed, he began to see this, this white substance kind of sparkling. He went out there, and there were wampum beads. They were already formed. They were, like, gifted to him and he picked them up. In this painting, then we can see what it must have been like to have the ducks or the geese flap their wings together, pick up this, this water, and then these beads were revealed to him. So they were already made. They came from the creator to him because he needed 
to take those words that he was contemplating on the condolence, put them into these beads, and then use those beads to begin to heal the minds of everybody. There are two types of wampum beads. They're tubular beads, only about a quarter inch long. The white beads are made from this channeled whelk shell, as we can see here. The center column is broken down into pieces and then eventually cut, ground down, and drilled in order to produce the white beads. The purple beads come from the quahog clam cell. You can see the outer ring of the shell is purple. Now the old shells were quite large, maybe six to eight inches in diameter. Today, it's really hard to find a shell with all that purple in it. But white and purple become the two primary colors used in wampum. White generally represents peace, purity, powerful ideas. The purple would represent the opposite to that, death, darkness. When your mind gets uh, fallen on the ground because of death, it represents all of that. So we have both life and death, sorrow and renewal represented in these wampum beads. So in what they call the condolence ceremony, the clear-minded side uh, that hadn't suffered the loss lifts the minds of the mourners, those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. So this, what happened to Hiawantha with his daughters becomes the model for our chiefs and our clan mothers and for our people, that you have to resolve the grief that death comes. You're supposed to straighten out your house, put everything in order so that the people are able to do their duties in order to keep peace in the house. So through this process, we're able to restore what we call the good mind. You know, the good mind actually started in the creation story. It was part of the creator's mind. It was brought back to us by the peacemaker, and he's encouraging us to use this good mind, which means to be fair to all people. We can see in this practice set of wampum strings that are used by the Cugas that were collected in the 1930s by a guy named Frank Speck. And he wrote down in this chart that we can see what the main message of each of these strings are. And there's a long speech that goes with each one of them. These were actually glass beads that were used to practice the condolence because to actually use the real beads, that was big stuff. So as we can see, they start with wiping the tears in your eyes to clean out your ears, to clean out your throat, straighten up your whole body. They go through this long list of rebuilding the mind, the spirit, and the body of the individual who's suffering this loss. So condolence is used within the great law in order to replace a chief who passes away. And then we put antlers on that new candidate to show that he's now become the chief, picking up where the old man left off. So it's this seamless transformation from the old chief to the new chief. He has the same title, he wears the antlers of authority, and he's also given a wampum string by the clan mother, as we can see here in this painting by Arnold Jacobs. He's placing the deer on his, on his headdress, showing that he now has the authority to act as a chief. But those first three parts of the condolence are very important. The wiping of the tears, clear the ears, clear the throat. It's like your mind can't work well when you're carrying this grief. And when you're carrying that grief, you can't see well because of the tears in your eyes. It's almost as if dust settles out over your whole body. It gets in your eyes, causes the tears. So we have to remove those tears so you can see how beautiful the world really is. We can restore the brightness of the day. And that dust also settles in your ears, and so it makes you hard of uh, hearing. So you have to clean out uh, your ears so that you'll hear the kind, comforting words of the people around you. you also hear the joyful noise of children and birds as they sing again. And then we would take some cold water and help you clear your throat to restore your voice, also to encourage you to eat again. Those three things become a very important part of understanding the Great Law. And these are some other wampum strings that came from Grand River that were collected by the Smithsonian. J.N.B. Hewitt, who was a Tuscarora scholar, coined the term the requickening. That's what he calls this part of the ceremony, where the, all of these things that we're talking about were taking place. You can see here then the, the tears, the ears, the throat. But he also continues on with the heart, uh, limbs, your feet, your seat. And this became also a tradition that we would use in making treaties. The only way we could make treaties with somebody is if we were to condole them for their losses, to lift up their mind and their body and their spirit so they can hear us and see us and understand us. So what started in the great law of a way of helping people get ready to receive the message of the great law became the mechanism by which we were engage the newcomers to extend the rafters of our longhouse to ensure that peace would exist. So when a man is made a chief through this condolence ceremony, he's given a short string of wampum beads, his white wampum. That represents his title, or this is what they call the horns. So placing the horns on the chief means that you're actually giving him this wampum string. But as we can see in this old photograph of a Tuscarora chief, Isaac Patterson, his wampum strings were a bundle of strings, many multicolored. So things uh, change through time. Uh, different uh, chiefs, different positions might have a different set of strings. But generally, all of the original 50 chiefs would have a string of wampum like the one shown here. So one of the first wampums uh, that was uh, made was this circle wampum. And it said it circles the people. Think of it this way. All Haudenosaunee people are born inside this circle. 
and we have a birthright then to all of the laws, the traditions, the beliefs, uh, the way of life of our ancestors. There are 50 strings hanging down here that represent each of the 50 titles of the chiefs. There's a double row of beads that go around the outside there, and they're twisted together. And they used to say this represents the great law and the great peace that would result from the great law. For each string, they said there's a clan mother, and then there's a chief standing there together in a circle. So think of it, it's almost like a circle of trees standing there, all of the same height. And for some unknown reason, there's a different number of chiefs. Onondagas have 14, Senecas have eight, Mohawks have nine, Cougars have 10, the Oneidas have nine. Now in the narrative of the great law, it kind of talks about the peacemaker going to these villages. He's wanted to meet the most evil-minded men in every community. And he wants to transform their thinking, turn them from men who were advocating for war into men advocating for peace. So with these 50 titles, you could assume there are 50 villages, uh, 50 main leaders that he confronted throughout our time. So it's hard to say exactly why we have these uh, different numbers, but there's also a story of how these uh, nations relate to one another. In that circle wampum, as you can see here, there is one string that's a little longer than the rest. A lot of people are confused about that. They think it represents Tadadaho, but when you look at the names around the circle, you realize it's not him. There's a different way of recording which chief goes along with which title. It's almost like a seating plan. This is the way the nations are supposed to sit in council. The Onondagas at one end, the Senecas and the Mohawks at one side, the, what's called the Elder Brothers or the Three Brothers, and then the Oneidas and the Cugas on the opposite side. So when council, it's kind of a male-oriented system. It's uh, male chiefs talking to other male chiefs. But behind every chief is this clan mother. So it's a balance between the women and, and the men and how we govern. Ironically, the Canada chose the symbol of the circle wampum to represent a submarine that they commissioned in 1965 called the Onondaga. So you can see how that wampum is replicated behind the back. So it's kind of amazing for us. It represents peace. For them, they use it as a symbol to defend them. At the same time, look at the title. In Latin, Invicta means the unconquered. Maybe unintentionally, but it turned out to be true. We still are the unconquered Haudenosaunee people. A condolence cane was developed, a long wooden stick with uh, graphics for each one of the titles as we can see here. And this stick is used to help to keep track of the, the sequence of names and the ceremonies, but also a little indicates about a story behind each one of the titles. So there's 50 titles. They're divided uh, into the five nations. And on the cane, they're shown on opposite sides with the Mohawks, the Onondagas, and Senecas on one side of the cane, and the Oneidas and the Cugas on the other. This is a set of wampum strings that are attached to a single piece that represent the nine Mohawk chief titles, three for each of the clans. So there's three turtle clans, three wolf clans, three bear clans, each with their own clan mother, each with their own chief's title. I imagine each nation had a set of strings similar to this. Unfortunately, some of them become lost, and even this one was uh, removed for a long time. It's only been recovered within the last decade or so. They said when the peacemaker assembled the chiefs in that circle, like the circle wampum, he gave them their instruction, told them how to be a chief, the things that they have to think about and how they use their good mind to render good decisions for the sake of the people and the future generations. And he took an arrow and he broke it. He said, see how easy one arrow is to break? But then he took five of them, bundled them together, and showed how strong it is. If the chiefs can remain united in their thought, can remain committed to each other, they can ensure peace for many generations to come. However, if they start arguing, they start disagreeing, they stop coming to the meetings, it's almost as if they're pulling their arrow out of that bundle. And each one that gets pulled out weakens that bundle. So he placed this bundle of arrows in the center of that circle, reminding the chiefs that their job is to use the good mind to render good decisions for the sake of the future generations. Then the peacemaker planted a pine tree, a tall white pine in the center of that circle. Old white pines are really huge. I was in the woods near Rochester, New York. I was looking at 300-year-old white pines. They were probably about six, seven feet in diameter. So imagine how big these trees could get to be. But the peacemaker used the white pine as a symbol of strength, that peace will never grow old if people are tending to it. If we put our minds to it. But peace often gets tested from without or even from within. It's like a big wind's gonna come and try to knock that tree over. So the chief's job is to make sure that whatever trouble comes our way, they, they remain strong in their minds, that they remained one council using one mind to render good decisions. So the peacemaker's instructions to the chiefs to remain strong are seen in this wampum belt. On the bottom, we can see what it probably originally looked like. 
Unfortunately, it was cut into two, as we see on the top part. 1877, and Chief John Buck, the Skanawati, he was the wampum keeper at the time. He said, this belt represents the tribe standing in a ring, joined hand in hand. And the compact was so strong that even though the tree might fall in, it could never break this chain of unity. So linking their arms becomes a symbol of the chief's job. When their arms are linked and their minds are together, it's an unbreakable circle. And if that strife ever tried to push that tree over, the chiefs would keep it from touching the ground. So linking our arms becomes an important symbol, joining our hands uh, together. Whenever we made treaties with other native nations or the Europeans when they arrived, we would link our arms together in a chain of unity. We would add them to this circle. They would come in and join us because we realized in order to be at peace in our land, we have to treat each other as if we're members of one family. And that was one of the founding principles of the great law, that all people are equal, all people are deserving of justice. So we have to stand together in that unity of thought. This is a painting I did a long time ago, 1975, and I'm trying to illustrate what the first council was like. We're working with uh, some community elders and some traditional chiefs, and they described this wampum belt that I depicted here, a white belt with five purple diamonds. Unfortunately, I've never been able to find that belt, but they said that was the first belt. But those were the only people I ever heard that from. And so it's really hard to say, but I tried to show the chiefs gathered in a circle and the peacemaker negotiating with Tadadaho to remove the snakes from his hair so that he would join this confederacy. And when he did, the snakes fell out of his hair, his body was straightened up, his mind became good, the good mind, and we were able to form then this confederacy. So on this wampum belt here, although it's usually called the Hiawentha wampum belt, it's really this five nations union, or the five lands belt. Five lands put together in one, so that we're one people. And this is when we begin to call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee, people of the long house. It's one family living together. And the symbols we can see here, the tree in the center represents the Onondaga Nation. The square on the far left represents the uh, Mohawk Nation. Then the Oneida Nation, uh, the Onondagas in the middle, the Cayugas, and then the Senecas. So together, we form this confederation. And the little white line represents the unity. It almost looks like a chain, the unity of thought, the path of peace. Now, the reason why the belt is purple is because this was in very dark times. Our people were, were, were actually hunting each other down. There's uh, murder and warfare all over the land. It was very dangerous even to go get some water. So this belt represents that hope, that peace, will sustain the people in the future. So wampum has these symbols of memory, and it's ironic because there's been a big discussion among our people. Is it a tree or is it a heart? Depends on which way you hold the belt. Some of these belts were held up and the message read or recited, halfway through the belt would be turned over and the rest of the message recited. So I could very well see that at one point it may be start off as a heart, get halfway through the story, you turn it over, and then it's the tree being erected. When the belt was first photographed, as we can see in this picture, the belt was shown, what most people would say is upside down. But when you hear what the Onondagas had to say at that time, in the early 1900s, they talk about it representing the heart, that we're in union together to form one. So I would like to say it's not an argument which one it is, because it's actually both, that in our heart should be this tree of peace. That's what unites us together. One heart, one mind, one voice, one people. So the great law has these three principles then. We're supposed to use this good-mindedness, supposed to be fair, have uh, justice for all people, and if we combine our, our thinking together with strength, the unity of thought, it creates a great power. But it's not just a military power, it's a different kind of power. It's almost like a spiritual power. And that allows us to relate to one another the way that we're intended, and then allows peace to prevail in the land. And when peace prevails, we're very healthy people. So this is a health plan as it is a government plan. Healthy minds can make good decisions. When you have an unhealthy mind, like Tadadaho had in the beginning, you can't make a good decision. So you have to deal with, deal with the stresses, the grief, the troubles that your mind may have in order to be a good leader. I mentioned that the peacemaker planted a tree of peace, and the original chiefs put together a wampum belt to symbolize that tree. You see the details here, this, this stylized pine tree growing tall. It's a huge belt. Now, sometimes it was called the dust fan or the council president because the story behind this belt is that one of the jobs of the chiefs, one of the jobs of Tadadao, is to keep what they call the creepy, crawly things from entering the council. That was really its descent, to always have a good mind and use an even tone, not to get angry with one another. 
and they have to sweep away all the negativity, keep it away from the council fire, keep it away from the place where the chiefs sit, because that negativity can destroy the unity. So this peace will never grow old as long as we're meeting in council, using a good mind, and thinking about the future generations. So you can see how the Tree of Peace Wampabout's stylized version of the white pine, the ever-growing tree. The white pine was chosen because it has these great white roots that grow, and as you can see here, they kind of grow right on the surface. They can grow over rocks, and they're huge in the woods when you see them there. And the idea was you could follow those roots to their source. It would lead you to the tree that was pounded in Onondaga over a thousand years ago. On the branches of that tree, you can see five needles coming together in each little bundle. It represents like the five fingers of our hand, the five nations, all coming together as one. So the white pine becomes the symbol of the great law, symbol of this peacefulness. But there's also a wampum belt dedicated to Tadadaho and his duties. His primary responsibility is to bring the chiefs together when matters are affecting all of us. And this is a confederacy matter, something that comes up that affects all of the people. Each nation and each clan was supposed to deal with their local matters, but when they couldn't resolve things, sometimes it would make its way to the Grand Council, which was held at Onondaga. Tadadaho's job was to invite the chiefs to there, explain to them the nature of the matter before them, and then monitor their discussion as they go along. So this belt reminds me of the Tree of Peace belt. The white pine is unusual because the bottom branches kind of face down towards the ground, the top branches kind of face up towards the sky. And then there's this diamond pattern running up the middle. Some people thought it represented the 14 Onondaga chiefs. Some thought it represented the unity of all of our people. Whatever it is, we show that Tadadao has a primary job to make sure that our leaders gather together, make sure they use a good mind, and then they render decisions that represent this justice and fairness. But sometimes they also have to defend their, our people and get our young men to come forward in defense of our great peace. This is a painting I did of the Tadadao at the time. His name was Leon Shenandoah. And I have him as if he's having this conversation with the original Tadadao. One thing they told me is that evil or dark thoughts, or disruptive thoughts, this bad-mindedness can always invade our council. It's always constantly struggling to get the attention of the chiefs away from the great law. So the chiefs have to be extraordinary people. They have to be really strong people to keep their mind focused on, on their task, which is to maintain the great law, maintain the great peace. So you can see here the old Tadadao is almost trying to reason with him, almost trying to talk him into forgetting his duties. And I think this is something we all have to wrestle with. It's not just our chiefs that go through this, but all of us have to do it. We are all part of the great law, and the quality of our mind determines how well the great law is going to function. They say that they made a big white mat that the chief sat on. This is a section of that mat. It's a metaphorical map. It was made out of white wampum. It was probably four, six feet long when it was first made. They laid it upon the ground, and they said that the chiefs will use this. So this is a reminder of the peace and purity of the great law. It's hard to see in this photograph, but the center part is white, and there's two purple rows where the purple beads run horizontally on that. It's a very unusual belt. We only have a small section of it left. They also gave this chief this wooden cane, or this wooden staff. They said whenever something comes to cause harm, tries to upset the fire, they have to use this stick to flick it away from the fire. They have a wing fan to dust the mat off, but then they also have this rod. It took me a long time to realize what this was about. And it's really about the chiefs, particularly Tadadao, having the authority to call the young men to come to defend the Confederacy. When people are trying to destroy the council, trying to destroy our chiefs, trying to destroy this great law, we have to have a vigorous defense of it. And so that stick, the thing that flicks that away from us, represents the young men willing to use their minds and their bodies to defend the great law. When the peacemaker gathered the chiefs together, he asked them to share a meal from this common dish. And inside that dish was a beaver tail. They said it was the most nutritious meal. They said, this is what our chiefs should eat. So we can see it in this wampum belt here. We can see the dark figure in the middle representing the bowl, the white rectangle representing the beaver tail. Sometimes I wonder, if this is one of our problems today, because I have never seen beaver tail served at a Grand Council meeting. Maybe we've been eating too much chicken. We have to get back to the power of the beaver tail. Women were given a special responsibility within the Great Law, particularly those of the clan mothers. So we see in this belt called the Women's Nomination Belt. And it shows the clan mothers there, their arms joined together in unity, 
They have a responsibility to ensure that young men can be stood up who can handle the responsibility of the great law. The clan mother is always trying to help the young men be good young men to maintain this great law. So she has to pick a candidate out of the men in her clan to become the next chief. And this Wampum Belt tells about that. It also tells about how she has a responsibility to supervise their work, to work with them, and if necessary, to remove them if they don't fulfill their duties. We can see this detail of this little purple square. Now, one story says that that represents the council fire of the clan mothers, that the clan mothers are supposed to gather from time to time, renew their strength, renew their stories, and help each other do a good job. So we have 50 titles, 50 chiefs. We also then have 50 clan mothers. So the clan mothers function in unity and harmony with the chiefs, but they have a special authority and responsibility to ensure that the chief represents the voice of the clan. In 1907, John Arthur Gibson dictated a tradition called the female chief. He meant the clan mother. He said she has special duties. She's supposed to provide the cooking for all of those that attend the council. Now, at first, this sounded a little sexist. You know, it's just women do the cooking and men will do the thinking. But what it says is that by the quality of the food that she provides, it will satiate the people and make them peaceful. And they will become right as to their strength and also their minds. So it's metaphorical as well as it is physical. Yes, she has to ensure that good food is there, like the beaver tail, so that the men and the, can think well, that all the people attending the council will be in their right mind. But it also said everything is put on her shoulders. The decisions uh, for her family rest in her hands. She has to nominate the male leader. She has to work with that man. If the chief uh, wavers away, she has to kind of bring him back in line. She's always thinking about what's good for her family and what's good for the Haudenosaunee generally. It's a big responsibility that the clan mothers have. There's a very unusual set of wampum strings that was in a museum collection that talks about when they do stand up this candidate, you actually stand up five people. You see the nominated chief, who is represented by the white string, the one with white and purple beads, that represents his assistant, and then there's some other strings. One would represent that of the clan mother, and then the two purple strings represent what was called the female cook and the male cook. Now this was based upon the note attached to this wampum string that was collected for this cuba title. Today people may say the female cook and the male cook are the faith keepers. But there is this metaphor about cooking, about providing good food in order to come to a good mind. Just as the chief is given one wampum string to be his antlers or his horns of authority, there's also a purple string attached. When that chief passes away, they would send this string around to notify everybody that this man passed away, uh, when they were going to have his funeral, and then hopefully soon after that, they would find a way to put a new person in his place. Another important wampum was the Confederacy Ember, as we called, or the Council Fire. And as we can see here, it's five strings, long strings of wampum that's tied together at one end. One scholar wrote that when he attended a grand council, they laid it out so it would be like spokes of a wheel all coming together in the center. Tadadaho or Onondaga would give the Thanksgiving address holding these strings. They would talk about what the meeting is about. They would lay these strings out during the council, and at the end they would pick them up. So it represents what we call the fire, the council fire. Almost like five logs put together attached at one end. When the Tuscaroras joined, a string was added to it, and sometimes that string is all purple or sometimes half white and half purple. And what it said was when the Tuscaroras came, basically a lot of them were Christians because they were, had a big battle going on in North Carolina. And what the other chiefs said is, you can join us, you can take a seat among the younger brothers, and then once you restore your traditional ceremonies, we'll transform that string and produce it all white. The Tuscarora nation is very active at restoring their ceremonies, trying to retain their language. So maybe in the near future, we'll see this council fire become six strings of all-white wampum. In 1924, the RCMP moved in at Grand River and ousted the chiefs and tried to establish an elective system. A lot of people believe they confiscated all the wampum belts, but these are the only things I could find that they actually confiscated. A string of beads, it's either purple and white, that was used uh, as the council fire in the old council house in the village and a bag of loose beads. That's all they were able to acquire. They tried to acquire the others because they understood who holds the wampum holds the authority. And uh, they kept this for a long time. As basically it was returned to the chiefs, I think it was about 1986, when the electric council returned this wampum back to the Confederacy Council. Whenever a council was called, Tadadaho would have a runner send wampum beads to all of the delegate chiefs. It's a notch stick. Each notch would represent a knight, and how many knights 
before the grand council would be convened. Now today it's usually just one string of white beads attached to it, but in the past, depends on the nature of the message, you could have many different strings like this one. From 1714 to about 1722, the Tuscarora nation joins the Haudenosaunee, enters into this confederation. These two wampum belts acknowledge that. The one on top where you can see it almost looks like steps, those are considered rafters to the longhouse. So we can see five of these rafters strengthening the old longhouse, the Grand Council, and then we see a sixth rafter, it's not quite as the same, being added to that. And you'll notice down in the lower right corner of the belt on the top, there's one little segment of that rafter. The story attached to this belt also explains, now that the non-natives in our backyard, and they were causing the Tuscaroras a lot of problem, we had to find a way to bring them within the longhouse once again. How do we extend the rafters to these people who are building their villages next to ours? The belt on the bottom acknowledges then that we're going to be called the Six Nations. I think it was first mentioned in 1722, and we've been known that ever since. Now, some people argue that the Tuscaroras weren't included in the Great Law because there's only 50 titles and 50 chiefs, but at this time, 1714 to 1722, our Grand Council made a decision that the Tuscaroras are going to be the Six Nation of the Confederacy. The Oneida Nation also has a wampum belt. It relates to the Great Law, but also talks about the recovery or the restoration of our alliance after the American Revolutionary War, where our nations fought against each other in many ways. The Great Law was uh, severely tested during the French and Indian Wars, during the American Revolutionary War, during the War of 1812. The Oneidas and the Tuscaroras allied with the Americans, uh, and other nations uh, allied with the British, and we actually fought one another. We spilled our blood on the battlefield, in many ways betraying the underlying message of the Great Law. But, like all things, we had to restore that. We had to use our good mind to be fair to everybody, bring them back in, so that we can say that we're Haudenosaunee, one people living under one law, and this wampum belt attests to that. Whenever we wanted to invite another nation to come to the Grand Council, we would send them this wampum belt. Or if we wanted to admit them in, now there's many different ways people can get admitted into the Confederacy. It could be a full adoption, or, or they, they could come in as a member nation like the Tuscaroras, and many variations in between. But we would invite people to come. But they also say that this belt serves as a memory of the clan law that was established in the Great Law, which means clans are the primary political uh, unit within the Haudenosaunee, and that you're not supposed to intermarry between our clans. So we have a unity of clans. All members of the Bear Clan are related, no matter whether they're Onondaga, Seneca, or Mohawk. We also recognize that people in the same clan will not marry one another because that will create some disunity and harm in the future. When other nations came to the Grand Council, we would offer them this hospitality or welcome belt. The diagonal lines represent what we call rafters or their braces. Metaphorically, they're supporting our confederacy, supporting our house because they are coming to join in a discussion of peace. A lot of our council meetings with other native nations were a way of forming treaties, of forming an alliance, uh, creating unity, uh, joining our arms together with them so that we can coexist. This belt, again, we can see the rafters. It represents when Akwesasne was admitted into the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in 1888. What it really means is that after the American Revolution, the Mohawk Nation became split. Some people came to Grand River, some went to Tyndanaga uh, earlier, some went up to uh, towards Montreal, where Ganawage and Gunasatage are, those that were allied uh, with the Catholic religion and their French uh, allies. But after the American Revolutionary War, we had to reassess, how are we going to coexist? And the Confederacy kept meeting, but sometimes the uh, Mohawks were, weren't attending those meetings. So in 1888, the Grand Council that meets at Onondaga decided that the Mohawk fire of the council that meets there will be represented by Akwesasne. And that's what this wampum belt talks about. Today, there's a great movement to recover the understanding of our ancestors and recover the hidden story of these wampum belts. What are the teachings in there? These are two of our leaders, uh, Jock Hill and Sid Hill, who are involved in this recitation of the Great Law. We're able to actually have the wampum belts uh, in our possession. You know, for a hundred years, they disappeared, taken away by collectors, anthropologists, and museums, and it was a century-long struggle to recover them. Here's a very unusual belt that we just received uh, back from the Smithsonian. There was a painting done of it, and the story attached to the painting says that the belt was cut in two during the American Revolutionary War, because our people couldn't decide what side to support. And that's why it has these six star-like figures uh, between these two rafters. But I've since found another report, another part of the belt was still intact. 
So it's really hard to say. You can't always trust what's written. Sometimes the historians got it wrong. Sometimes anthropologists didn't understand. And then sometimes our people told them things to kind of to distract them away from the real truth. So to recover the knowledge of the wampum belts, you have to become like a cultural detective, trying to weed through all of the evidence, try to determine what is the real story of this belt. And unfortunately, there are several belts, but we don't know the story. But look at the imagery, this big belt on top. It's a huge belt with five white squares, most likely representing the five nations, or the other belt with the five diamonds representing their nations and their fire. A lot of times these belts would be used in treaties. It'd send messages back and forth. They could be reassigned a story several times, and sometimes the messages just get lost in history. There's also some wampum belts that are attached to condolence. These are very unusual. This is one that was identified with corn planter. It's a purple belt, which represents condolence, but there were five spaces in the belt where beads were intentionally left out, representing the five nations. This is a wolf clan condolence belt associated with a Seneca chief. It was last used when Edie Parker uh, passed away. They had this wampum belt on his uh, casket. And you see it's got these five hexagons representing five nations. Then there's these white lines at either end which were interpreted to be that they're the doorkeepers. So this was associated with the function of the Sega nation to be the doorkeepers of the Haudenosaunee. There was a very similar belt, almost the exact duplicate of it, that came from Gunasatage. So it made me wonder if the one belt represents the Senecas as doorkeepers, does this belt represent the Mohawks as doorkeepers? But there are two other belts that specifically talk about that. The one on the top is the Seneca doorkeeper belt, where the Senecas are going to be like guards to the longhouse, almost like, like dogs or wolves who will announce when danger is approaching and will step forward and gather the young men to defend the Confederacy. There's another belt on the bottom. It's called the Mohawk wolf belt. You see these two figures holding hands and then these two animals, dogs or wolves, at either end. And then we can see these lines going off the end. Now there's seven lines there, so some people have thought this belt represents uh, the seven nations of Canada. There's various interpretations about that belt. This Condolence Council Summons belt was collected at Gunasatage. They said it was used to invite delegates to ensure that they send leaders when we're going to install a new leader. They said this belt was used to remind other chiefs to send their delegates to the Condolence Council. Make sure that you have people there to help install the new leaders. There are many, many other wampum belts. Some of them are directly related to the Great Law. A lot of them are premised by the principles of the Great Law. This was a photograph taken here at Grand River in about 1870 when Horatio Hale, an anthropologist, came to study the wampums. Imagine we were all living back then. Imagine we would see these belts in council. We would know their stories. You can see some of them that we talked about here today. Wampum has an everlasting value to our people. It codifies the words of the peacemaker. It carries the words of our ancestors forward. It gives us some sense of hope about the path that we're supposed to follow. There's two interesting examples here, two contrasts. One is a U.S. Uh, coin that was uh, designed in 2010, where we can see that I went to that Confederacy wampum belt wrapped around these five arrows. This was uh, to commemorate the Haudenosaunee. The other is the grand seal of the Haudenosaunee designed by Warren Lyons. So we can see those 50 men standing in a circle, their hands held together. You see the tree of peace in the middle. You can barely make it out, but there's the figure of the peacemaker there holding the five arrows as he stands on the white roots of peace with the weapons of war buried beneath it. And then all of the family clans born within that circle. Two very different ways of looking at what wampum means, what the great law means to our people. For the last several years, the chiefs have uh, taken on the responsibility to have recitations of the great law in our various communities. They started at Oneida Nation, went to the Onondaga Nation, or Alakwasasi, and next summer, they're going to be at uh, Grand River. You have to understand, it's kind of a work in progress. It's all fairly young people. We're trying to recall what our ancestors said. We're trying to learn the teachings of the wampum belts. We're trying to put the narrative back together as best we can so that we can make sure that at least for one more generation, the great law of peace will continue. But we're lucky that we have these wampum belts back. We're able to recover them from the museums. And this is the first time in a hundred years that the wampum belts were actually there, all of the welts associated with the reading of the great law. So it's a great moment in time. A few more years of this, we should all become more knowledgeable about what the great law is. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Hopefully you'll join us for our next uh, lecture series. It's going to be on the Turo wampum and trying to take a look at what does that mean to us today to have a treaty relationship with our neighbors. Donate.